This is episode 47 of the Immunology Podcast, Structural and Mechanistic Immunology with Dr. Hao Wu. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Raud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Immunology Podcast, rate us and leave us a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Hao Wu from the Harvard Medical School on the podcast to talk about her research elucidating the molecular and cellular mechanisms that govern the assembly, regulation, and therapeutic intervention of supramolecular complexes and innate immunity. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... A reminder that Immunology 2023, the world's leading annual All Immunology Meeting is taking place in Washington, D.C. from May 11th to 15th. The meeting will feature eight major symposia, each focusing on a specialized area of immunology research with multiple presenters. Topics include peripheral neuroimmune uh, interactions, cell death and immunity, innate immune memory, aging and obesity, and immune responses, immunotherapy, myeloid cells, mucosal immunology, and immunity to emerging pathogens. That's a lot of topics. Visit www.immunology2023.org for more information. Hello, Jason. Hey there. How are you? Good. How are you doing on this day? Today's Valentine's when the episode is released. What are you and the missus doing? Well, so we have a tradition that we don't celebrate Valentine's Day, but near or on Valentine's Day, we use that as a time to book our next date night free of children so that we don't have to do terrible Valentine's Day dinners because all the restaurants like scramble to just put a bunch of stuff out and it's usually not as good as what you normally get. So yeah. it's Valentine's Day, we'll be booking our next date night. Nice. I remember this. We discussed this before and I like the consistency. You got to plan love when you have children. <laughs> I see. Thanks for the heads up. I'll keep that in mind. Why don't we move away from kids and we go into, you know, other little academic children? I mean, this, this I think these papers are like children to those who write them, right? They, they're, they're, ex but this, those desired children are expected and nurtured and then shown to the world. Well, having talked to my wife, she would agree that papers are harder to make and produce than babies. <laughs> Um, they definitely take at least as much time. A lot longer. There's probably <laughs> equal amounts of pain just spread out a little differently and less fun at various points. All right. So. So papers. All right. I'm. I'll dive in. I got. I got one that I was very excited to read. Mm -hmm. uh, you know why? You know, day job and this job all at once, right? So this one is immunity. Ambient oxygen levels regulate intestinal dysbiosis and graft versus host disease severity after allergenic stem cell transplantation. First author is Keisuke Seki. Last author is Pavan Reddy. It comes out uh, now-ish. Okay, uh, it's released February 14th, but it's already available online. So this is a cool paper because it solves, establishes causality for microbiome. It's well known that graft versus host disease has a microbiome component. There's been germ-free studies that show differences, and this paper talks about how the germ-free studies may have shown the opposite effect. Germ-free had less issues than conventional mice, but this is suggesting that that, may have, that was in the early days of germ-free where they really weren't truly germ-free and before sequencing. So that it, it, it may not have been actually germ-free, may have just been getting rid of dysbiosis. But long and short, there's a lot established that, that the clinical course of graft versus host disease is influenced by the microbiome. But how, what, causal, that wasn't really understood. And so the pathway described here is they the, 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 the story is simple and the data takes a while to get there to really establish causality. But I'll give you the summary story and then talk about a few key studies that they did. So the fundamental story is when you have graft versus host disease, you have T-cell infiltration of the tissue. That T-cell infiltration disrupts the intestinal epithelial cells, the IEC's ability to utilize oxygen. Their oxygen utilization goes down. The ambient oxygen in the intestine, the lumen goes up. That leads to dysbiosis. That dysbiotic microbiome, which favors certain species, leads to worse graft versus host disease. And that, you know, sense through 
there's a T-cell attack. It disrupts complex two of the mitochondria. And, and then they ferret this all out. And there's HIF signaling involved. So what this paper does, though, is they show that the dysbiotic bacteria alone don't do anything. That if you have dysbiotic bacteria in both in healthy mice and in, in if you have dysbiotic bacteria and you precondition with that, and that's the bacteria they have, that that doesn't change the outcome. They then just both stink after graft versus host disease. And then, and so they do these sophisticated studies with a combination of bulb C and black six mice. So you can create graft versus host disease, right? Cause you have to have non syngenic mouse. And they, they ferret out through a bunch of antibiotic studies and microbiome studies with transplants of microbiomes into germ three and conventional antibiotic condition that you have to have the graft versus host and then the bacteria in that order. So just the bacteria in other systems doesn't do anything. If you ameliorate the dysbiosis, so if you go back and use an oxygen binder to, to chelate out oxygen, like an iron binder, that drops the oxygen tension that is caused by graft versus host and reduces the dysbiosis and reduces the graft versus host disease. If you similarly disrupt the dysbiosis by transplanting a healthy microbiome afterwards, that ameliorates the graft versus host disease. So it's the graph, it's the immune cells acting on the epithelial cell, which change the oxygen tension in the gut, which then changes the bacteria in the gut. And those bacteria with this dysbiosis makes you have worse outcomes from graft versus host disease. Now, how that bacteria is doing it, they didn't get that part solved, but they got this entire causal chain mapped out all the way through. And that was really cool to establish. It feels like an incipient also in a re, uh, self feeding loop because if then you get more inflammation because you have the dysbiosis, or is it like inflammation exclusively from graft versus host disease? That would not all inflammation is the same. I think they actually did a colitis model and showed it didn't have an effect there. Oh, okay. Uh, but specific T cell models that, that will act on there and disrupt the mitochondria that affect the oxygen tension will do that. And so some forms of colitis for as well have that. And they do make that analogy in this paper. So they're saying that, so it is the oxygen, oxygen consumption by the epithelium that changes. Correct. Okay. And that's because the T cells are somehow generating, act, activating the epithelium or, 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 at, or at, because they're attacking the epithelium. Where, where does this change in oxygen? They did a T cell model of colitis that recapitulated this the autoimmune T cell. Right, okay. so cells attacking the epithelial cells makes the epithelial cells use less oxygen. I see. Uh, less okay. oxygen increases the oxygen in the gut, but the gut bacteria are usually facultative anaerobes or obligate anaerobes, and you shift the population when you increase the oxygen. Yeah. A bad yeah. way for the host. All right. Bang, boom, more disease. Wait, what is the microbiome not doing? Oh, my God. Don't be so smug about it. Just because I work for a microbiome company on the forefront of medical research. Yeah, just, yeah, that, that's what I meant. Let me introduce you to my first paper of the day. Uh, this is, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting, I think very straightforward story. I liked it because of that. And it kind of, it's one of those stories that makes you think about the basics in a way. Let me introduce to you. Interferon gamma binding to extracellular matrix prevents fatal systemic toxicity published in Nature Immunology, February 2nd, first authored Josephine Kemna, and from the lab of Thomas Blankenstein at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in the beautiful city of Berlin. And in this paper, they, as the title suggests, they are looking into interferon gamma. And the fact that interferon gamma is, is a cytokine present across, uh, you know, vertebrate uh, uh, species, and has always a similar uh, inflammatory function. And although the, 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 there's some sequence homology, but there's certain variation and there's the, 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 the receptor binding domain changes between species, but there's one particular segment uh, which consists on four positively charged uh, amino acid in the C terminal of, of this molecule that are basically, in the case of humans, it's a lysine, arginine, lysine, arginine, 
and then across different species is very conserved, either lysines and arginines or other uh, positively charged um, amino acids. So in fish, in, dog, in frogs, in other mammals, it's all the same. And which suggests that this, this, this domain must be doing something important to be conserved like this throughout uh, animal kingdom. And um, so this type of positive charge uh, uh, residues are known to bind to, or are known as he heparin sulfid moieties that are part of the extracellular matrix. So they're basically polysaccharides that are found across animal tissues. And they, they are, have an affinity towards this, this, this extracellular matrix um, uh, element. And there has been always kind of a lot of ideas. What is, what is it that it's doing? Is it stabilizing the binding of the interferon gamma to the receptor, which is widely expressed across different uh, cell types? And is it, is it, is it supporting some, 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 what, is, what is it doing? Is it improving distribution? Is it improving, reducing uh, shelves or half-life? What is it doing? So what they did, and I think that'll make sense, they said, well, let's try to see what happens if we remove this uh, C-terminal domain. So they basically started, started small, and they show that um, when they remove this motif from, from the interferon gamma molecule, that doesn't really affect in vitro the function of the, of, of the interferon gamma. They measure things like upregulation of imaging molecules upon um, um, exposure to the interferon gamma doesn't seem to change. Um, they do see that if they remove this, this uh, motif, they, 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 they up abrogate the uh, binding to uh, upper and sulfate surfaces, uh, surfaces measured with a, a surface plasma uh, resonance, so a way of measuring the affinity uh, between two uh, proteins. And they see that although it, to some extent, it slows down a little bit the binding rate of the interferon gamma to the receptor does not really affect the stability of the binding. So there's really doesn't seem to be a part of sustaining the binding of interferon gamma to its receptor. And so they do some, some uh, mice in which, so they have some uh, tumors, uh, so they have some um, mice in which they have, uh, they don't have endogenous uh, interferon gamma or interferon gamma receptors. And they, what they do is they inoculate them with tumors that are secreting a interferon gamma uh, labeled with GFP that uh, is in a gene that is induced by doxycycline. So they can like, choose when this tumor is going to produce interferon gamma and that it has or not the residue uh, in, in its construct. And what they see is that the main effect of removing the residue is the fact that uh, the interferon gamma doesn't bind to the extracellular matrix anymore. And this affects the kind of the persistence uh, of, of the interferon gamma in, on the tissue, but also the serum levels. It, 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 results, it, it results in lower serum levels if, if the interferon gamma uh, after, uh, so when, when they measure the, the mice after they induce it with, with doxycycline. So this suggests that this binding to the extracellular matrix kind of is keeping the interferon bound to a surface and it, it prevents it from just like going or circulating around in the, in the blood. And so they this doesn't affect, if you have a tumor that is expressing interferon gamma uh, that has either either of these uh, with or without the, the, the um, this domain, it doesn't affect the, uh, on itself, the growth of the tumor. So also the, this interferon gamma seems to be affecting the tumor in the same way. So if you have, if you compare it to a, a tumor that doesn't produce an interferon gamma, they grow less because interferon gamma is known for uh, interfering with tumor growth and proliferation, but it doesn't depend on this binding domain. But what it shows is that tumors that are expressing uh, this lack of, uh, without this domain, generate more mice are more sickness in the mice like inflammation and they, they this there are these effects of of inter, interferon gamma it, it is stronger so they, because there's more in the blood it seems to be affecting the mice more systemically moreover uh, they so they they went they thought okay what if, what if the idea is that the, inter, the interferon wants to be of this domain is to keep the interferon in the area that is being produced in there, which is needed, so we can have strong concentrations there, 
but prevent the difference circulating all over the body, generating disease or like generating uh, side effects that are uh, undesirable. So they generate a mouse. And I like this because they use CRISPR to generate uh, a new mouse in which they uh, they they delete this four amino acid uh, motif in the in the endogenous interferon gene using CRISPR, and I think mouse geneticists and people that spend doctor you know full PhDs making mouse models I'm gonna cry are gonna cry where they they realize they just shoot like how easy it became nowadays to say well I'm just gonna generate a mouse and just to try this one thing and uh, they 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 just took um to guide RNAs against, you know, uh, the area in which they wanted in the, in the exon where they wanted to remove these four amino acids. Uh, so it would be uh, four times three, 12 ba base pairs. So they just made two cuts there and they included a electroporated together with a repair template, a fairly small one, 16, uh, um, about 150 nucleotides, not, not even. And then they just electroporated uh, zygotes and then they put them into uh, this uh, mock pregnant, this, this pregnant mice, the non-pregnant mice that are pregnant, I forgot how they're called. And they just got the pups and they just, uh, um, what was the word? They just genotyped them. And then that's that was it. Um, I'm not sure how, it doesn't take exactly how long it took, but it seems a lot easier than uh, traditional uh, ways. So that's pretty cool to see this being used already. Anyway, this mice. If in the context, they, they mice are fine. So they, they don't have the domain. They grow fine. They have no issues at steady state. Uh, however, when they infect these mice with LCMV, with a virus that uh, can generate kind of a chronic, more chronic infection, it did affect the, 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 the health of the mice. So the reduction of the, the addition of this domain resulted in, in the mice that could not gain weight after the initial infection, mice kind of lose weight. And then around day nine, the, the wild type mice start recovering because they're clearing out the virus and they are looking fine. They're doing well. But this, this mice uh, had side effects that were quite dramatic. They had uh, uh, problems with their with their uh, hematopoietic cells or the hematopoiesis. They had liver damage. They had, although there were no differences in viral load, they were clearing the virus, but they were suffering a lot more. Um, so I think that what was very interesting is, so what what the, what, the, what the authors conclude is that this domain seems to be important to keep a little bit in check the toxicity of the release of this interferon gamma. I like this paper because it really makes you think about this idea that cytokines are not, often we think that just you know, being released to the bloodstream or whatever, and they just like, you know, bump around and do their thing. But there's a lot of thought, non-thought non thought by evolution to, to in a way, uh, also consider these things. So this uh, controlling this kind of very important, very powerful um, mediators, and you cannot just let them, you know, just go around and do whatever they want. So by this, by uh, details like this, keep the, keeps the cytokines in check. So now, you know, those three, four amino acids, another reason why they're there seems to be to keep them in the right place. That's fascinating. For me, the question is the evolution of this, right? You have an extracellular matrix that has this binding site that serves as a soak for a cytokine to kind of help localize it, but also not overwhelm it in the system. And it needs to be just right, right? Yeah. And which means that then the cells evolved to release this much cytokine to know that some of it's going to get soaked up by this to have like a time release function. Well, I mean, it seems to have evolved really early on because this is this motif is seen in fish already. So it seems maybe even another animal, maybe in, in even in the context of more rudimentary immune systems. Well, fish still have an adaptive system. That's kind of their point. They're vertebrae. Oh, well, the immune system. What a what a wonderful, fascinating system. Anyway, let me let's not get too poetic because we're never gonna move on to the next thing. I know. I, I got a segue for you that actually works. We we talked about receptor binding domains, so I'm gonna talk about intracellular signaling and binding. And, and ligands. Boom. Perfect. Got it. 
Move right. forward. Come on. This is phosphonostatide acyl chain saturation drive CD8 effector T cell signaling and function. First author is Joy Edwards Hicks. Last author is Erica L. Pierce. So this is a paper you have to really read to get all of the detail, but at a high level, we're going to be talking a little bit about PIP signaling today, one of my favorite signaling cascades. As we know, PIP2 gets converted to PIP3, and that induces a lot of signaling in cells during activation, but PIP2 is also, its presence alone is a signaling, and there's lots of phospholipids, but there's a very small pool of PIP2 and PIP3. What people forget about is it's not homogeneous. PIP2, for instance, can be 3, 5, 3, 4, 4, 5, 3, 5. You know, there's three, four, and five positions, and two of them have to be phosphorylated to be a PIP2. Which PIP2? But that being said, the carbons that are on there, remember, so these are carbon tail with a anostatide head with phospholipids. So it can make a membrane, right? And both sides of it stick in, and then you have the lipid tailed barrier, and that's your, bi, your phospholipid membrane. Okay. Well, the carbons on there have varying degrees of saturation. It's not all one type of carbon on the lipid. And this paper really put together the fact that in T effector cells, not all cells, not memory cells, but in effector function cells, T effector cells have higher amounts of unsaturated, so, or, or sorry, of saturated, so less double bonds. They have higher amounts of saturated PIPs. If you eliminate this by blocking the enzymes that do this, which I'll get into in a second, you lose T cell effector function and fitness. So the type of PIP2, not the 3,5, but the carbon on the end is important for T cells. What they show, though, that is interesting, it links it to amino metabolism, is these lipids are all made, and they do this for uh, radioactive glucose labeling, carbon 13. Um, is that the it is de novo synthesis so during t-cell effector activation and function you have increased glucose uptake and utilization that glucose is metabolized and converted into saturated pip molecules and those are preferentially made during t-effector function and drive the downstream signaling that you would expect of phospholipids in t-cells other T cells don't seem to do this. Other T cells seem to have other populations they care about. Total levels of PIP aren't really influenced by this in de novo function. There's salvage pathways and other things. But this de novo synthesis is really important for the saturated versions. And there's also some enzymes that are also involved downstream. If you knock out any of these in the pathway to make the PIP, the, the saturated PIP, you lose T cell effector function like proper functioning. It's not about like concentration in the membrane or otherwise, it's really you have to have this specific version which drives things. They couldn't solve why. Oh, and I forgot to add, the paper is in uh, Nature Immunology and came out, uh, received May 3rd, accepted January 3rd of 23, published online February 2nd. But it it's fascinating. So they use mouse studies to look at this. They look at tumors. So they find at the very end, so PD-1 blockade, so PD-1 blockade restores glucose uptake function in immune cell and T cells. This apparently is already known, new to me. But they show that responders versus non-responders, even in human melanoma cancer, based on like clinical assessment, the responders have more saturated phospholipids and thus more effective T cell effector function. So basically the efficacy of your T cell effector or effector T cells are directly related to your saturated PIP composition. Wow, that's so specific. It's quite extraordinary. And is there, is there like an enzyme, specific enzyme that is uh, this saturating or desaturating? Oh, there's several. It is a name that does not come easily yeah, CD1 PT levels. It's it's an enzyme involved in this, as is their lipocardiolipid acyltransferase. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, the good old lipocardiolipid yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and sterile coenzyme desaturase. So yes, so fundamentally, there are enzymes involved, multiple enzymes involved in this pathway. And if you screw any of them, it doesn't work. If you supplement afterwards with saturated lipids, so you don't have to de novo synthesize, you compensate. 
All right. And so this, uh, these enzymes are upregulated or differentially expressed on CD8 cells. This is CD4 effector cells. Oh, CD4, CD4 yeah. effectors. Yeah, not cytotoxic. Um, so they also, did, sorry, they did CD8 as well. They looked at both CD4, yeah, but they're all effector cells as opposed okay. to cytotoxic cells. I mean, that's quite extraordinary that you have such things that seem so feel so trivial. If you're like, ah, there's some some lipids there. Where are you going to put the the, the phosphate phosphate groups? They, they do map this out. This is a you know, I don't I can't show the visual. They do have a very nice figure that shows the metabolism pathway mm, for this. Okay. And so all you right. can see like where all the disruptions are, and they and they they ferret out the whole chain and show that the entire chain is hosed. Very interesting. Okay. All right, so now that we're talking about lipids, you know what has lipids, butter, and you know what kind of butter you Americans like a lot? Peanut butter. Do you like peanut butter, Jason? I appreciate the segue. I love peanut butter. Actually, I had it for a sandwich for lunch. This is why I feel so sad that so there's so many people that have peanut butter allergies or like peanut allergies. And so this is uh, what our... our uh, the paper I'm going to present is trying to address. This is the need, the, the desperate need uh, for uh, solutions to severe food allergies such as peanuts. And this is a paper that comes, uh, it's called Peanut Allergen Inhibition Prevents Anaphylaxis in a Humanized Mouse Model. Uh, Science Translation Medicine is a journal. Uh, 8th of February is a publication day from first author Nada Alacras. And it's from the lab of Mark Kap uh, Kaplan, uh, Mark Kaplan, Kaplan, sorry, uh, that from the University of Indiana, who was in our podcast uh, last July, talking about his role as editor in chief in Immuno Horizons, the open, uh, the open access journal from uh, the Association of Immunology. And so I think it's a very cool uh, work because they're they're looking into a platform or um, that there is being developed to provide some kind of uh, immune um, regulation for people with severe allergies. So in this case, they are looking, as I said, into uh, peanut, peanut hypersensitivity. So what does, it, what does it happen when people that have this kind of hypersensitivity, basically IgE is uh, modulating, is mediating uh, the, the most of it and what you have is that you have allergen-specific IgE that binds to uh, high affinity receptor on mast cells, on uh, basophils, but mostly, I think, mast cells. And upon binding to its antigen, this activates mast cells. There's degranulation. There's release of inflammatory mediators, histamine proteases, prostaglandins, cytokines, chemokines, it's a mess. And if it's very severe, this can become an aphylactic shock. People can die from, from this from such uh, exposure and you know there's a lot of effort trying to prevent this they trying to cure or, or remove this this allergy in people that have it and so there's studies suggesting that you know peanut exposure particularly in early age can minimize uh, allergies uh, there's things such as oral immunotherapy that in, that, in, uh, that are uh, basically providing small uh, subsequent exposures, trying to generate some some uh, tolerance to the to the antigen, but the truth is that um, it, there's not really good uh, therapeutic uh, options for people with food allergies. And so, in this paper, they are looking into a what I call a, H, a CHBI, which is a a peanut allergen specific inhibitor. That the so and the acronym stands for covalent heterovivalent inhibitor, uh, in which I think is very very interesting. They uh, basically they look into epitopes. So there's in the case of peanut allergy, there's very um, dominant epitopes that seem to be mediating most of the allergic reaction, and they find um, find uh, uh, molecules that are that selectively bind to the um, the uh, FC region of a, a allergen specific antibody IgE uh, and because this this molecule also has other other uh, elements that 
generate that that bind. So one with one hand, it binds to the, the anti antigen binding region of the antibody, and on the other hand, it binds to kind of the rest of the, of the body of the IgE, and then it sticks there. So it's covalent. the The binding becomes covalent, and the thing is, and the IgE basically is useless. And in this way, they kind of can kind of take out IgEs that are specifically binding the antigens that are associated with allergic reaction. So what they do, they have this, this molecule that binds, that prevents binding to peanut allergens. So they have a specific uh, allergen, which is called ARA H2. And the basic, what they show is that by treating mice, so they have, first of all, they make a human IOS mouse a system in which they, 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 uh, they can obtain human mice so they're originally immunodeficient mice. They're loaded with, with the human hematopoietic stem cells, and then they kind of recover a mostly human immune system. And they have human mast cells in there. So they have mice that have, can be loaded. Then what they do, they inject the mice. They, they provide antibodies, IgE antibodies, that are monoclonal antibodies that have previously been identified to be specific against these peanut allergens. So they put this into the mice. So basically what they do is they load the mass, the human mast cells inside the human house mice with these antibodies. So when they expose the mice to the allergen, boom, they get a, an allergic reaction and an anaphylactic reaction in the mice. So beautiful model to study uh, this thing. And so using this mice, they show that use, that this inhibitor can really prevent activation of mast cells. So if you, if you, uh, on the one hand, if you administered it before the challenge with the with the uh, with the antigen, you can pretty much abrogate the the allergic reaction, really showing that you are getting in the way of these antibodies binding to the allergen and activating the mast cells. So the mast cells don't become activated. They show that. And what I think it's also this also uh, lasts for up to two weeks. They see benefit of 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 this uh, treatment for up to two weeks. And what is also very interesting is they also try this as a preventive kind of uh, 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 protocol, but then also as after challenging, after um, administering the allergen, they wait for a couple of minutes, which would be the amount of time that a person that has allergy starts realizing that they're having an anaphylactic reaction. And then that's where they inject the, the, the inhibitor and they can still show that that benefits uh, and reduces quite substantially the um, anaphylactic uh, um, response in these mice. And that's very important because this could mean that you could use this as an emergency, maybe in a, an emergency a re a, um, treatment right after you realize that you're starting to get an anaphylactic shock. And uh, this also, this in the case, most of the experiments were done with injected uh, antigen, but they show that in, in the case of, uh, this is of course a oral antigen. So they show that this can also work if you uh, administer the uh, the antigens as an oral gavage, and that uh, it can also protect from, uh, from an anaphylactic response in, 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 in this situation. So I think it's really cool because, you know, maybe there's, there's a, you know, option for treatment. I mean, they, they, they say, well, maybe something can be like, by monthly injections, so just to keep your your mast cells kind of uh, quiet, uh, so maybe you still have some reaction, but not something that will kill you. Well, that's really awesome, and I, I like both the suicide inhibitor, cut yeah, of it, plus the practical experiments they did in the mice, which is really important. I think that's really uh, neat to see an eye towards clinical application that early on. Yeah. Now these humanized mice are really great tools, aren't they? Yeah. They are. When I was at UNC, I think they were developing some of the first ones. Hmm. It's kind of crazy how they do it. Yeah, for mice, they're doing. I mean, my 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 lab also does this, does some of them. There's a lot of work though, because you need to like irradiate them like when they're born, basically, and you inject them right away. So if they're born on a sun on a Friday, then you have to go inject them on Sunday, no matter what, because then it's late. It's like it's like a lot of maintenance for these mice. Yeah, no, it's tough. All yeah. right, yeah. well. I don't have a great segue for the next part, but we are going to get into other structure function relationships, I suppose, with Dr. Hao Wu at the Harvard Medical School in just a moment. But uh, as a reminder, whether you're looking to attend an immunology conference this year or to expand your network, make the most out of your experience by downloading our collection of tools to help you guide your next event. Stem Cell Technologies downloadable checklists and guides include recommendations on how to get ready before attending conferences, tips for networking, best practices for your LinkedIn profile, and more. 
Download the conference toolkit at www.stemcell.com slash conference hyphen toolkit. We are joined today by Professor Hao Wu. She is the ASA and Patricia Springer Professor of Structural Biology at Harvard Medical School. And her lab has some fantastic work on uh, both crystallography, maybe earlier work, and now cryo-EM uh, to understand and elucidate the structure of macromolecules and has some really nice work, particularly on inflammasomes and the structure of other mole uh, molecules of interest, such as the TCR, uh, so the BC receptor, receptor receptor. So I'm looking forward to talking to you today about your research. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm excited. So I'll, I'll, I'll start. So what I wanted to get at with, with cryo-EM to start at before we deep dive into the inflammasome a little bit is maybe if you could explain for people who are less familiar with it, why there's been such a um, explosion in cryo-EM as a technology and what it's allowing us to do in immunology or just generally speaking with structural biology that we couldn't do before with you know crystallography and, mm -hmm. and NMR, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that technology. Yeah, oh, definitely. So my background uh, was actually crystallography. That was my graduate training. Uh, so uh, cryo-EM, cryo-electron microscopy. So the method itself was uh, actually developed a while back. And you may know that a few years ago, uh, a number of scientists uh, obtained the um, Nobel Prize for developing the methods. So uh, what happened was, uh, for a long time, cryo-EM is a kind of a low resolution technique. Uh, you know, you can, uh, th the reason to cryo-preserve your sample is because the radiation damage uh, uh, otherwise would overwhelm the sample, would completely kill all the uh, features that you want to see. So you collect data with the sample preserved at a low temperature. So about maybe 10, yeah, it's about 10 years ago, I would say, um, uh, a uh, number of people, you know, uh, who who are in the the pioneers in the field, they've been trying to develop a kind of detector, trying to increase the signal to noise or the quantum yield uh, of the detection, and they succeeded in doing that. Uh, these are uh, what they call um, direct electron detectors, um, and th this just completely changed uh, how much uh, signal uh, you can uh, capture. Uh, Previously, you know, the the yield, the quantum yield uh, on these electrons are uh, very, very low, and that's why uh, you don't get um, uh, very good signals. And and these uh, single molecules have very signals, a very small signal to start with, anyways. So, and if you cannot capture uh, everything that's coming out of it uh, because the detector is not good, then uh, it's a total failure. So. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago, they, I would say the development of these uh, uh, direct electron detectors is really the key uh, elements in this, uh, what they call resolution uh, revolution, resolution revolution. Uh, uh, it, for us, uh, I, I mean, I, I could say that uh, also around the same time, the EM uh, instrument um, also undergone uh, a, a great uh, improvement. So the current microscope, the 300 keV microscope, uh, they they just have the beams are much more coherent uh, and uh, they just uh, uh, give you much better data. So the instrument itself, I would say the detector, probably the most important thing, I think. And the other thing with the detector is that because it's very fast, you can uh, uh, fractionate your collection um, uh, using a movie. So uh, each image is actually a movie with multiple frames. And by doing this, you can correct for beam induced motion. So that's another, um, okay, so maybe I should go back a little bit. So the issue with the resolution is several fold. One uh, is the sample uh, can get damaged very quickly. Uh, that's why the cryo aspect. And the other thing is uh, once the sample get hit by a beam, it moves. So um, and because of the movement, uh, if you had to collect uh, the image using, uh, you know, a certain width of time, then the image will be blurred. So because of the fast uh, data collection that uh, this uh, new technique enabled, uh, you can collect the movie. And then you can correct the motion uh, because you collected different images uh, at the different time points. 
yeah, th those are crucial. Uh, uh, equipment and also at the time, software is also uh, uh, being developed uh, to make cloud EM data processing much easier. So uh, in the in the old days, uh, I remember I did a little sabbatical, probably around 2010 or so, uh, at one of the labs here. Um, that I was still at Cornell, but I did a sabbatical here at Harvard Medical School with Tom Waltz. Um, all the software is uh, uh, really rudimentary. You know, you have to edit all the input. You have to, you know, do Linux uh, uh, editing and, and this and that. So I actually ended up uh, uh, writing a little little softwares to make uh, things uh, um, uh, more uh, more more workable. Uh, but yeah, by the time uh, ten or so years ago, uh, um, softwares have uh, also been greatly improved. Uh, Rely on is one, and now also CryoSpark. So uh, yeah, so collectively, I would say this uh, resulted uh, in uh, the resolution revolution and also the spread of uh, uh, using Cryo EM by so many more labs than has ever been. I would say all the crystallographer crystallography labs have converted, <laughs> if you will, to Cryo EM labs. Yeah, um, just be just because they are. Uh, they're there because of all these uh, developments so one could easily switch fairly easy i mean anytime you start to learn something new of course uh it's an obstacle but it's not a, uh it's a surmountable obstacle so um and because of the power of this uh, technique so many labs have switched from uh, from um a per that from the perspective of a person that is not into uh so much into structural biology so I would, what I when I think of cryo AM, I think on the one hand I understand that because you don't need to crystallize your molecules, and you can look at a much wider range of molecules that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, and that in principle the preparation of a sample is supposed to be easier than making crystals for, for 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 uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, and then that you basically what you because you use such a you you take so many pictures and you have such an intense kind of uh, algorithm or software that puts them all together that's the beauty of this of this of this uh, uh, technique that is different to a standard because as a crystallographer when you were using standard crystallography it's i'm thinking of you know the famous Rosalind Franklin uh, image of the yeah, DNA yeah helix. yeah, yeah. And so I always ask myself, is that the kind of data? Did you actually how before you had computers that would make these models for you that that like they do now? What was the kind of analog information that you got? Because it feels to me it's so strange and so diff so difficult to interpret those data. I mean, that's because the data is in the what they call uh, Fourier space. You have to mathematically convert those data back to what you could call real space. And that's, uh, you, you know, atomic positions of- uh, You get a ruler mm -hmm. and start measuring the space between the lines and do manual exactly. Fourier transforms. And this exactly. is what I do in school for one of my final exams. Okay, there wow. you go, okay. I mean, getting crystals are just so difficult, especially, uh, actually that that uh, just tied into what I was gonna say. Uh, that is, um, we started out doing crystallography, but then we realized uh, a lot of the uh, proteins uh, in our system form these really higher order uh, oligomeric structures. That's not even homogeneous. You know, you have different lengths of filaments, uh, for example. So, so uh, maybe about 2010 or so, uh, or 2009, so around there, we decided we have to do EM. You know, because that's the only way we can look at it. So, uh, yeah, and then I think we uh, just really lucky. Uh, that we hit uh, right at this uh, junction uh, with the cryem uh, revolution. Well, and then it works really well with really big things, which crystallography doesn't always play well with, and it works really well with membrane-bound things. And so, and so then let's talk about a big heterogeneous thing, the inflammasome, and and, and briefly because we did cover it on here before. But but tell us a little bit about what you like you did the NLR. P3 inflammasome disc. You got a cryoeme from front. What did we learn immunology-wise by seeing a picture of the structure? Because that's always a structure equals function. 
what did we learn about the function of this protein from that picture that you were able to get? Right. That's a, that's a deep question. Inflammasomes are uh, caspase activating machineries. Uh, they're supramolecular complexes. Uh, NRP3 is one of the uh, major inflammasomes because uh, NRP3 has been implicated in so many different human diseases. And uh, it can be activated by so many different stimuli. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, how the structures, right, who cares about structure? Why would, they, why would you care about the structure? So uh, I would say uh, not just the uh, structure that we just published uh, this year, 2023. Uh, I have to go back to uh, a few years ago when we were uh, started trying to elucidate the NRP3 structure. We were able to get several different kinds of structures. One is the monomeric structure in complex with NEC7. This is a cofactor in NRP3 activation. Uh, that was the first glimpse of how an inactive NRP3 looked like and how uh, the uh, NRP3 interact with NEC7. And then, uh, uh, we, we, but we didn't get the active structure. So it, it has been very difficult to reconstitute the uh, active NRP3 structure. And then the second thing we got was the full length NRP structure. And it turned out uh, completely different what, than, from what we thought because we thought NRP3 would be monomer in the inactive state and then change into an oligomeric state uh, upon activation. Uh, and then this oligomeric structure would bring, uh, would recruit uh, um, the downstream molecule and also bring the recruited caspase into proximity so that they can become auto-activated uh, 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 into active caspases. Um, so uh, it turned out that the inactive NRP3 is already oligomeric. So that was uh, quite surprising. And we called this uh, particular uh, structure called the cage structure because uh, it looks like a cage with parts of the NRT, NRP3 protein hidden inside this cage. So the effector domain of NRP3 is actually hidden in this uh, either decameric or dodecameric uh, cage structure so that it stays uh, inactive until being activated. Uh, so the, the new structure that we published um, uh, 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 what, you know, was, uh, was a work from um, quite a few years, and we finally succeeded it because uh, we realized uh, that uh, NRP3 activation requires several different signals that we really uh, have to uh, recapitulate uh, this in order to reconstitute the inflammasome. Probably one of the uh, important thing was that unlike another inflammasome that we worked on before, which is the NRC4 inflammasome, the NRP3 inflammasome cannot fully assemble without recruitment of the adapter. So that's why the current structure we have is a complex with the adapter protein ASC. Without it, it doesn't completely form the structure. Uh, the structure, okay, I think there are a few things that the structure uh, tell us. Uh, one is the role of NEC7. So what is this cofactor uh, doing uh, in this inflammasome assembly? So it turned out by comparing the cage structure with the final disc structure, uh, we think that the next seven is there to break the cage. Uh, because it's already oligomeric, you have to break the cage. Next seven compete with the same interactions that's in the cage. So next seven break the cage and then allow an RP3 to assemble uh, into a disc and the disc structure is where it becomes uh, active. Um, another uh, uh, insight, I suppose, uh, is this conformational change between a ADP bound, ADP bound um, uh, inactive state NRP3 to the ATP bound uh, active NRP3. Uh, this conformational change um, is very dramatic and, uh, uh, and, uh, and it couples to uh, the understanding of how these NRP3 inhibitors may inhibit these proteins by preventing it from undergoing this conformational change um, because the inhibitor really cannot bind to the active state. So it kind of lock the ORP3 into an inactive state. Uh, and the uh, structure, of course, also revealed new interfaces uh, in the disk structure. Um, and those uh, uh, certainly can become a future therapeutic uh, target for, um, uh, for making anti-inflammasome drugs. Uh, 
and the interaction with LRP3, of course, is another uh, target one can uh, use uh, to um, uh, disable these uh, uh, deactivation of these inflammasomes. In fact, there are companies out there uh, that's uh, uh, trying to get rid of Nex7 uh, or or allosterically inhibit Nex7 so that it can no longer interact with an RP3. Oh yeah, so I forgot about trafficking. So from a few years ago, uh, 2020 probably, starting from there, we realized that uh, MRP3 was localized initially at the Transgolgi network. So this cage structure is actually on the Transgolgi network. And then upon uh, stimulation by MRP3 activators, these TGN membrane disperses into TGN vesicles, small vesicles. And what we think is that uh, vesicles allows uh, allows the transport onto the microtubule network, the retrograde uh, transport network to the microtubule organizing center or the centrosome. And that's where next seven is. So we think this trafficking or this breakage of the transgolgi network is crucial for NRP3 to be transported to the mTOC and there it will meet next seven. So uh, I think the structure also then helped to elucidate this, you know, um, uh, localization, location dependent uh, signaling. You go start from somewhere and then you end up somewhere else uh, that can enable this activation. And this uh, uh, microtubule organizing center localization uh, shares similarity to these uh, method for uh, the cellular method for degradation of aggregated proteins. Um, these are something that's called the agrosome. Um, so, so actually by analogy, we found that if you inhibit autophagy, because the mTOR for the uh, agrosome uh, to be assembled at the mTOR, the reason is to degrade, to form agrosome around these aggregates at the mTOR, uh, because mTOR is a place where a lot of donating, you know, donor membranes uh, uh, can also uh, localize. Uh, so it turned out MRP3 inflammasome can also uh, be regulated by autophagy. Uh, and actually, autophagy, I think, sets a threshold for the uh, ability of MRP3 uh, to become activated. That's very interesting. So it's another connection between autophagy and inflammation, a completely different mechanism. Absolutely. If you inhibit autophagy, you see a huge, these uh, uh, MRP3 puncta at the MPOC is so much bigger. They're like, they're like huge, you know, <laughs> visually striking. Interesting. I I saw some of your uh, data on the on the cages on the inflammasome cages, uh, NLP NLP three cages. It's, it's very interesting to see how you can really pick up those structural differences and the the difference when you had this mutated uh, version that didn't form the cages. How you can completely disappear from your cryo uh, uh images. Uh, it's so cool that you can see individual molecules and follow them. Uh, in this way, it's like literally you're looking at them. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole purpose of uh, looking at these things at the molecular yeah. level, you know, one at a time. Um, yeah. Right. And that actually leads to uh, uh, electron tomography that's, you know, related to CRA-EM, but it's called CRA-ET, in which you can look at uh, how these molecules are distributed inside a cell. You know, mm -hmm. how, how, so that's, I mean, that's kind of a, project that we're trying to pursue, how it localized on the Golgi membrane, we have no clue. So we really want to know that, how uh, uh, how it, you know, gets uh, into the vesicles, why is it uh, called Golgi dispersion? Uh, those are all uh, questions that we would like to address. Are, are you going to do any of that live with like fluorescent signaling or FRET yeah. or anything yeah. else in cells outside of just EM based? Oh, definitely. So we do a lot of uh, cellular imaging nowadays in my lab because all these things that we're studying are these huge things uh, inside the cell. Mm -hmm. So there, it leaves us no excuse not to do cellular imaging. So, so yeah, we started doing that maybe starting 10 years ago. Yeah. So live cell imaging is a big deal. So definitely we, uh, we want to uh, look at uh, this uh, entire process of uh, from Golgi to the mTOC and yeah, and probably also, uh, uh, well, one of the postdoc is starting to do a, uh, a 
genetic screening to look at uh, other molecules that may be required uh, for uh, TGN dispersion uh, using imaging techniques. Cryem, I would say the bread and butter of the lab, but we, we do uh, also acquire, uh, you know, whatever else that's needed for our work. Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't want to focus too much because, uh, just exclusively on your cryo -EM, em data, but I do think it's so so impressive because we discussed another paper of yours in our show some time ago, in which you uh, looked into the structure of the B cell antigen receptor. It was also very interesting on uh, how you uh, the how you can look into this molecule. We thought we understood it, and apparently we didn't completely. And there were some interesting results from this. I don't know if you if you want to maybe quickly share mm -hmm. with the audience what was the the thing that surprised you the most about this 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 uh, structure. Right. So yeah, no, it's true, right? B cell receptor. You would think everyone knows how it looks like and all that. I think you know what. So B cell receptor has a IG 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 component. It, that's basically the same IG uh, that's secreted. And then it has mm -hmm. co-receptors. It has alpha and beta co-receptors, and, and they share homology. So for a long time, one thought that since you have two two chains from the uh, I, the, the IG that can recognize the antigen, and you have alpha and beta, they probably form some kind of a symmetric complex. You mm -hmm. know, what just alpha and beta are pseudo-symmetric. So, but it turned out that was completely wrong. It turned out alpha and beta together form a entity and that sits only on one side of the Ig molecule. Uh, so that creates some asymmetry uh, in the transmembrane domain, also in the extracellular domain. So that, that was insightful. And then uh, the thing is, uh, how does antigens can induce the activation of B cell receptor still remains unknown, even with the structure, because in our structure, we actually saw a little bit of the intracellular domain uh, with the ITAM uh, sequences. Uh, it's bound uh, next to the um, uh, co-receptor, uh, 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 to the transmembrane domain of the co-receptors. Uh, but the thing is, we just cannot imagine how antigen binding that's at the far tip, the top tip of the uh, uh, IG, IgM, the, we, we solved the IgM uh, BCR. So for example, at the tip of the IgM molecule, how does that transmit some signal to the inside? Uh, so we actually think that's probably not possible, probably not gonna have a significant conformational change. So uh, B-cell activation must be uh, sensing something else. And this something else probably, that would be our guess at least, probably will be related to this asymmetric arrangement. That is, there's still a lot of conserved residues on the Ig uh, because it's, you know, the co-receptor is only using half of the complex. So we imagine probably upon uh, antigen, band, antigen binding, something else got drawn uh, into the complex or, or something like that. Or maybe even um, in the resting state. This is actually what our our uh, collaborator uh, Michael Reth is a, a, a important co-author uh, in that paper. Actually, he he's the B cell uh, um, expert who asked me to start this project. So so he thinks B cell receptor uh, must be forming some kind of a oligomer before activation. So maybe that's why only half of it is occupied. Uh, by the co-receptors, mm. maybe the other half is occupied by another uh, B cell receptor, but that's you know remains to be a hypothesis, and that's something, uh, and also you know a lot, a lot, a lot more to do. It surprises me that we don't know that yet, because when you when I think of the T cell receptor, it seems to have been so extensively characterized, and we seem to understand every step in the activation and all of the different uh, ITAM uh, domains are involved, and all the all the co receptors. And but it, it really surprised me so much that we were still unsure about how the B cell receptor signals. I guess we focus too much on the B cells uh, producing antibodies, and not so much on how they got the instructions to do that in the first place. I don't work on vaccines, but vaccine centers now, uh, you know, start to invite me to give talks about uh, yeah. what the B-cell receptor can tell us. Uh, I would say a lot more work needs to be done. You know, we're really just at the beginning of trying to elucidate uh, 
uh, how this might even work. You know, we don't know how it works. Is the B cell receptor been less amiable to structural biology than the T cell receptor? Just generally, has that been one of the obstacles that it's just like harder to play with, so to speak? It's a it's a bigger thing, I guess. It's a it's a bit bigger. You know, uh, the T cell receptors have less number of IgS. These you know have like IgM has five different IgS uh, from the from the transmembrane uh, to, from the uh, beginning of the ectodomain to the top. Uh, mm. I mean, I think it's still just uh, Kraiyam hasn't caught up. I would say uh, I didn't think this was so much more difficult than uh, than the uh, uh, TCR TCR case. Uh, but you do have to co-express all of these molecules, and in our case, we had to generate uh, a cell line. My, actually, Michael generated a cell line, a B cell, kind of a modified B cell line that has. Uh, some proteins overexpressed and some other proteins endogenously expressed. So, you know, we just purify that complex out. Uh, I would say cryem really enabled this kind of structure determination because it doesn't require as much sample. <laughs> if you had to had to crystallize this, it's just impossible. You had, you know, set up those trays with just, you know, you probably can set up, I don't know, 10 conditions, maybe one tray, okay. Uh, it's just, yeah, to, to get, in order to get crystals, you oftentimes set up hundreds of trays. You just don't have enough protein to do that. So one of Jason's favorite molecules of all times is gastermin D. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> and I know that he's dying to ask, what are the insights? Because we, we've we done some molecule that has not been, uh, the, the its role has not been characterized that long ago. It was identified in 2015. Well, as involved in, in inflammasomes, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I ended up setting it because it was regulated by this phospholipid regulating protein that we worked on. Actually, what is that? Do you know how, how that works? I can tell you what it is. It's published. Okay. It's, it's called the TNF AIP8 family. Oh, okay. I know these things. Yeah. CIP, yeah. 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 So the, t the TIP family regulated, okay. if you knock out TIP, the original one, not, not the isoforms, but if you knock out TIP, okay. Uh, gas dermins are the most reg dysregulated genes. And it has probably, we think it had something to do with the phospholipid signaling, but we were never, never able to ferret it out before the lab shut down. Because we think there's a phospholipid binding domain on the pore forming part of the gas dermin. I also think so. I think for sure. I think for sure, actually. Yeah. Well, the, the cool thing is tips can hold the phospholipid inside them. They actually serve as an intracellular reserve of PIP2 and PIP3. Oh. Oh, I got, I got to read this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But anyway, you studied it from the pore, which is kind of the classical thing, right? Like tip, you know, gas dermins get cleaved by inflammasomes and make pores, and that leads to pyroposis. You had a pretty cool structure there not that long ago. So with with that, um, I think it's really cool if you talk a little bit about the pore, because when I think structural biology, some of the most famous structures have been um, like the sodium potassium ATPase or like the, just these ion channels in general showing how different ions of different sizes will either have interactions or not. And that explains how it could be selective for the bigger thing, but not the smaller thing. Why can't the smaller thing go through? Well, actually it doesn't have the stabilizing charges, but like that structural is really cool. And you kind of take that to the next level with this preference for uh, IL-1. So I don't know if you could talk about that just for a second, probably is one of our last subjects about like how this pore specifically kind of selects for IL-1, which is very bizarre, like just on its surface. That seems weird. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for that question. So uh, gas germans, they're substrates for inflammatory caspases. So they were identified as molecules that's important for paraptosis and also for the release of uh, cytokines. But when that was first uh, uh, elucidated, I think most people would have thought that these cytokines get released because the cell's dead. So everything just come out of the membrane. But when we solved the structure of the gastermine D pore, this is just this large thing that uh, probably has an inner diameter of about 20 nanometer and outer diameter about 30 some uh, nanometer uh, contains somewhere, uh, the structure we saw contains 33 subunits, but uh, it can vary, you know, within a range. Uh, so 
the question that we started to ask is that, that uh, does something like this could have any selectivity at all? Something this big uh, can have any selectivity at all? The, the question really spurred out of this observation that if you look at um, uh, the secreted stuff from a cell that's dead, you have both pro l one and mature l one But if you look at what's in the supernatant uh, of a cell uh, that's uh, that has inflammasome activation, but are protected by these membrane uh, uh, stabilizing agents such as glycine. You know, if you put glycine in the media, the cells does not rupture. So they still um, maintain their um, livelihood, but meanwhile secrete our one. So what happens in these cases is that only the mature ones are in the supernatant, but not the pro out one. So that's a bit odd. So so we started um, trying to think, is it possible that there's some kind of selectivity? And especially we thought the, the charge of the gastrocnemius deep pore, especially inside the uh, uh, conduit of the, of the pore uh, has a role. So the conduit, when we look at the surface of this conduit, it's very acidic, has a lot of negative, negative charge. And if you look at the pro domains, of interleukin-1 or interleukin-18, you also see that the proteome is highly negatively charged. So we thought, oh, maybe the, this negative charge helped to propel the release, and not the other way around, helped to prevent the release of the procytokines. But then once this pro-domain is uh, removed, then the mature cytokine can get out. So what we did was uh, first to uh, look at uh, in the purified system, just the pores that we formed on liposomes to see whether these pores can release pro L1 or uh, uh, can it release both pro and mature, or it can only release one. It turned out only the mature uh, L1 can be uh, preferentially released. It's not exactly, well, it, it's the release rate of the pro is so much slower than the release rate of the mature cytokine. It's not completely black and white, but it is uh, regulated by the kinetic uh, of the release. Um, so, so, so this is true for both interleukin-1 and interleukin-18, and I think really changed how uh, the field um, views these large pores, gastrocnemius uh, deep pores, and may maybe also other pores like perforin, you know, they also large and release stuff uh, into the cells. Um, so in a way, it tells you that uh, structure studies can uh, help to uh, <laughs> help to uh, look at a lot more than just uh, um, just the uh, atomic positions per se, you know, where they are and uh, the biophysical characteristics of these uh, surfaces can tell you a lot. Yeah, I guess the spores are more sophisticated than we initially thought. Exactly. It's good to give them some justice in that sense. The, the more we learn about the cells, the less you realize it's just stuff that just happens. <laughs> no, uh, uh The cell knows what it's doing. Like, there's a lot of these cases. Oh, yeah, we just thought it was just an open pore and just things went in and out. And it turns out that it was very selective or it was more uh, selective than we initially thought. That's the beauty of uh, structure studies. Almost every structure shock you in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say, talking about sophistication, like I think maybe the last question related to your research today is uh, I see that in some of your publications, you uh, you you use uh, this this software AlphaFold as, oh, yeah. okay. uh, as mm -hmm. part of your research. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. My question to you, without trying to sound too um controversial is alpha fold coming for structure biology jobs anytime soon actually i think it's really accelerating structure biology research uh as you know actually as illustrated in what we and others published uh the nuclear pore complex everyone almost everyone used alpha fold to get the subunit structures and then fit into the larger map uh, and without it, I would say it's almost impossible to uh, to interpret uh, the density at this medium resolution, you know, like six or seven Ostrom. Uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, why this uh, uh, explosion of uh, nuclear pore complex structures, uh, I think we just published last year, there was a whole issue of these structures from Science Magazine. Uh, right now, 
I think almost everyone I know, I mean, we are for sure use AlphaFold for every project that we work on, you know. <laughs> every time we hear a name of a protein, probably the first thing, uh, at least one of the first things is to look at the AlphaFold prediction to see if we can tease some functional thing out of it or not. Uh, every structure we solve, we try to uh, look at the alpha fold uh, structure first and see whether uh, it predicted correctly or incorrectly and how we can use that for model building. Uh, my friends in this field are the same. You know, everyone, everyone's using it. It's a, it's a great tool. Very interesting. Yeah. AI is, is coming to help us all, I guess. Yeah, I think it's helping at least uh, so far. You know, I don't think... AI can predict everything. Uh, it's just the information uh, that the conservation of information uh, that's so you, so so important for AlphaFold to work is very sparse for, for example, protein protein complexes or even protein ligand complexes. I mean, those are the things that AI people are trying to address, but I think those those would be much harder. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, if they can, they can certainly try. I think, and that will help structure biology, because whatever they can predict uh, would, uh, you know, help us to interpret uh, our densities, densities as well. It'll also help uh, drug design greatly. Well, we're going to ask you one of our fun questions to wrap up with. Okay. So my question for you is going to be, if you could have any superpower in the world, <laughs> excluding <laughs> eyes that have EM resolution or <laughs> that can do alpha fold for you, you don't get those two. It's too related to work. What would you have and why would you have the superpower? It's a good question. Yeah, actually, I, <laughs> as a person, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a superhero, so I'm probably going to give you a very uh, boring answer. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just want to be able to, uh, not to sleep, actually. <laughs> Legit. I would say the second thing that's on my mind, on my thing, on my second on my list is, uh, be able to read mind, you know, because <laughs> uh, sometimes I'm just so intrigued, uh, you know. Just giving a talk and knowing if you lost your audience or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that, that would be so, yeah, maybe too overwhelming, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be hard to just um, be yourself. Just, if you can yeah, hear yourself. or shut up all the voices around you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> The only, only work you can really do it at will because if you just start listening to everybody's inner thoughts, I think that would be terrible. That would be terrible. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I want to just follow up the, that conversation. So is there any hobby you would have always wanted to pursue but never had the time to yeah. and that you would do if you could just yeah. go through the nights without needing to sleep? <laughs> Actually, that actually that would be the uh, guitar playing. Yeah, I when I was a child, I played uh, some violin, but I was terrible at it. Uh, and <laughs> in college, I started picking up classical guitar, and I really loved it. You know, uh, Claire Delon, you know, uh, the uh -huh. Spanish romance, uh, just classical guitar, not not the when you play uh, accompanying a song. Uh, yeah, yeah, just solo, solo classical guitar. I I really like it. I just have no time. As you can see, Jason has a guitar, but it's mostly wall, a wall decoration. Oh, where is it? Oh, there is one. Yes. Is it classical? No. It's no, it's an electric. No. Electric, uh, yeah. You can't see, since we don't actually show the video, it's a Schechter Hellraiser, and I've actually been playing it quite a bit lately, so uh, oh. I'm getting back well, into it. In a band or? Not yet. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, on yourself first. Okay, okay. He's going to join the checkpoints at any moment. That or GI distressed. Oh, G I distress. That's that's more like you, yeah, yeah. But the checkpoints is is that a band where Jim Allen is in and then they play in the in the oh, SITC Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Jim Allison okay. is in a, in a in a they have a band uh, it's great and they they do some concerts here and there. The right, Jim right. has one too. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, everybody does. Leads it. Yeah. Lots of scientists have been. Yeah, Richard Flavel, uh here are Fred Ott, my 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 boss, Fred Ott, you know, uh the pogies, go pogies. Thank you so much for coming on. If uh, people are interested in your work, go to your website. Do you post your open positions there if you're looking for anyone or anything else to share? We do have open positions as we speak because uh, uh, seven people from my lab got jobs. All right. So our listeners, you know, if you're looking into some amazing structure biology work and you always wanted to hear more about the inflammasome, 
and live in New York City. Sorry, uh, Cambridge. Cambridge. You used to be uh, Cambridge. Boston. Actually, Boston. <laughs> uh, Boston. But it's oh, close gosh. enough to Cambridge, yeah. <laughs> that, that's probably why she got seven people recruited away in one week, is she has a great, excellent structural exactly. biology lab and biotech. Exactly true. Exactly true, yeah. So three people went to uh, in, uh, academia and four went to industry. Some are really, you know, early postdocs. <laughs> <laughs> but they know they know how to do cryam. That's it, gone. You know. Yeah, okay. I would, I would say I'm surprised, except I'm one of those people that recruits people. All right, stay away from me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, oh, it's fair. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm actually really happy that they have jobs that they want. You know, it's great. It's a, it's a, it's very satisfying for me. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get show notes, including as episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. And you can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback. Or if you want to suggest a guest, we'll be happy to hear that. See you next time.